difficult question. Why do the wicked prosper? The age-old question. And why do the good or the righteous suffer? You'll find this interesting. Um, I got into the writing of First Peter and knew exactly that some of you, like myself, have been through seasons of trial and tribulation, of persecution. And if we're not careful to look at why God lets this happen, we may inevitably end up wondering the questions you've heard me ask so often. Am I out of God's will? Have I offended God? Why me? Why not the other guy? He's way more wicked, right? <laughs> I was going to have the band sing this song, but I'll just read you. You know this is an old song. It was written in 1911. I tried to find the history, and there's several histories for this song called Father Along, but the words tempted and tried were oft made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long while there are others living about us never molested though in the wrong. And the chorus, you know, is Father along we'll know all about it. Father along we'll understand why. Key word, cheer up my brother. In other words, you're going through some Real hell on earth. Cheer up, my brother. Live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. It means maybe we won't get the full fulcrum of what God is doing on earth, but eventually we will. And if you stick around long enough, it'll make sense. God's doing something infinitely more important than the initial goings-on and happenings in your life. When we speak of the age-old question, why does God let this happen? Why does it seem like the wicked, they just keep going on. They're prosperous. They're well. And this question is asked by many people in the Bible. I think I've tried to cover this little bit by little bit. One of those echoes is the prophet Habakkuk I mentioned to you a week or so ago. He asked, how long, O Lord, how long will you let this happen? And many of God's saints, his precious ones in this book, asked the same question, how long? They didn't have the revelation we have. They didn't have all of this wonderful book we call the Bible that we have. So it comes as a strange surprise that where I'm going to jump in to hopefully straighten out the matter of why the, why the wicked prosper and why the righteous and good ones seem to suffer and why it's needful, why it's necessary. Believe it or not, the answer comes to us in Malachi. So if you'll open your Bibles, last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, and we're looking at the second chapter and verse 17. First, I must say, uh, I've given the background to this book. It cannot be sufficiently reiterated that the background to this, as this book of Malachi being the final book in the Hebrew canon, the last book canonized, you can look at the last book and look backward. Strangely enough, it brings sadness to my soul each time I read this, that God, through the prophets, Jeremiah speaking of the 70 years, Daniel who read the prophecy regarding the people being carried away into captivity, as Jeremiah was also one of those, as Daniel was also one of those, being carried away in successive waves, because God finally said he had enough. And this was the ultimate way to, uh, if you want, purge, try and get a hold and grip of God's people to get them back to where he wanted them. Unfortunately, in this carrying away, which was prophesied, this just didn't happen on a whim. 
If you read through the Bible, the close of Second Chronicles gives you the decree of Cyrus, the edict for those who had been carried away in captivity to return to their land. Cyrus, way before he was born, the prophet Isaiah spoke of him, saying God would raise up a king who would accomplish his will, a heathen king to accomplish his will. So all of these incredibly profound prophecies that have been realized, that God raised up two men, Ezra and Nehemiah, to help and encourage the building and the rebuilding of the temple and everything that the people who returned, the remnant that returned, saw as they entered into the city, the uh, disrepair, the, the ruins that were left. And, of course, the two spokespeople that gave encouragement to those saints, Zechariah, his eight visions, and Haggai, that gave encouragement to the saints at that time that a better day was coming. And through these words, it is staggering to figure that less than a hundred years has passed from that time, the return and rebuilding, less than a hundred years to the time of Malachi, where there's spiritual apostasy, the people are no longer, their hearts are so disconnected from the heart of God, they no longer desire with an earnest desire to please Him, they just go through the motions. So the background to everything that uh, I'm going to talk about today is in the framework that if you really read through this small book, last book of the, the Old Testament, you recognize that no matter how much history and how many promises were given to God's people, it seemed never enough. And how easy, if these people were some of them eyewitnesses or their parents or their grandparents had been those who had been carried away in captivity even two or three generations back, they would have had the witness of God's faithfulness in the lives of their family. And yet, by the time that Malachi is writing, a whole dash of indictments against the people. The book starts off with God saying, I've loved you. The people, how have you loved us? And a whole chronicle of their mindset and behavior is captured here. Now, I'm picking up at 2.17, and I need to tell you, Malachi 2.17, you can do your own scribbling in your Bible. I have do pl plenty of good scribbling in my Bible, but the real chapter break, there shouldn't have been a chapter 3 here. If there was such a thing as putting a chapter somewhere, it should have been that verse 17 begins the third chapter. Because the indictment against the people comes like this. You've wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, the people's response, wherein have we wearied him? How? And the prophet answers, When you say, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Or, Where is the God of judgment? They were basically complaining to God. And I want you to catch this, because it's something that even yours truly had to put on the brakes in my mind and say, Take a check here. Just... There are very few times in my life where I've been sitting reading something and something will not be applicable. But this one I said, take a check. Take a rain check and take a check again because this is one that spoke directly to my heart. How many times have we said, God, are you seeing what's going on over there? Come on, show me how. You ever done that? God, you seeing this? Good, I'm not alone. Now listen, God's not against us asking questions. There's a whole plethora of questions asked. God will not fall off his throne if we ask a question. But the mindset I want you to get here is that these people basically accused God of saying, God, you must approve of this evil because you keep letting it happen. You must endorse this behavior because seemingly these people over there, they are prosperous and we righteous good people over here, we faultless people, we holy, holy, holy people, because you need to get the other side of this coin here, that they're busy doing, look at those people over there, how they prosper and they're so wicked, yet these very same people were guilty of departing from God's ways, from bringing diseased and lame offerings, from filling the altar of God with their 
crocodile tears, no heart repentance, just the motions. So while they're saying, God, look over there. Look, God, are you not seeing? The message is what Jesus carries into the New Testament about judging others and the beam and the moat. Now, I tell you something, there are a lot of moat inspectors in the body of Christ. Just remember that next time, why Jesus highlighted this whole concept of beam and moat. There are a lot of moat inspectors, and I want you to catch the picture that if the moat is but a splinter, the beam, the word for the beam is the support of the house. So while somebody's over there saying, look at the splinter, God's saying, look at the beam. Take a look at yourself. The idea here is that a lot of times we look for these answers, and they are tough questions why it seems that other people are doing so good. And then the question comes, God, are you seeing this? God, are you aware of this? And unfortunately, a lot of times, we are guilty of doing this ourselves. Now, this, why well, I said the chapter and verse division is faulty because the answer, each one of these indictments against the people has an indictment, a response, a response that comes in the form of a question like, me? And then the response that is the telling details. So here we have the people saying, how? And Malachi says, you're basically accusing God of delighting in and prospering these evil people. And now you're saying, where's the God? It says of judgment, and I'd say of judgment or justice, either one works fine. The answer to this indictment, by the way, comes at what is chapter 3, and verse 1. That is to say, the answer is, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom ye seek, and I want you to, if you can highlight something or circle something, the Lord whom ye seek, whom ye seek, shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, whom ye delight. There's another one to circle. Whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. And then the fantastic question is, but who may abide in the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like the fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. Now watch the switch. And I will come near to you to judgment. There are two groups of people being spoken of here. I hate to tell you this. And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against false swearers, against those who oppress the hireling in his wages, those who defraud the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside from the stranger from his right and fear not me, saith the Lord of hosts. I stop right there. Two groups of people are being spoken of, and it is paramount that we understand what the response is, because the response, quite frankly, if we get the right picture, you'll see that your why, Lord, or where are you, Lord, has a purpose. Now, I can't tell you that everything that happens is going to be pleasant in the life of a believer. That's what most evangelists do. They tell you, come on, come on, come on. And then you come and you're all happy because the evangelist told you that all your problems, all your sins, all your fears, everything you need, Christ will provide, except it omits one thing. When you come and when you follow, your life may turn to hell for a little while. Little, little taste of shaking up. There is no promise of it's going to be smooth and it's going to be... Uh, paved for you, except that Christ went before you. He's the first goer, and the way he paved was straight to the cross. So I'm not inclined to program people's minds to say, think that Christianity is the catch-all solver for everything instantaneously. And, and the paradox is that if we trust Christ implicitly, he does take care of everything. He does make a way. He does care for us. So I guess if I was trying to highlight what Malachi's 
response is through, it is the word of the Lord flowing through the prophet. He says, I'll send my messenger, and he's speaking of John the Baptist, of course. I've highlighted this before. Isaiah prophesied the same thing. If you remember in Isaiah 40, Isaiah talked about the one who would prepare the way, who would go before Christ. And even through the early passages in the gospel records, we have this record in Luke chapter 1, verses 76 and 77, where it is John the Baptist's father that says of the child, Behold, this child will go before the Lord and prepare the way. So we have a picture of, I will send my messenger. And I want you to catch this because there's a transition from Isaiah's indictment, you have wearied the Lord, to a message that although it is flowing through the prophet's mouth, it is the Lord speaking because he says, I will send my messenger, personal pronoun. This is purely God speaking through the voice or the mouth of the prophet. I will send my messenger. He shall prepare, prepare the way before me. I ask you a question. Do you really think with the indictment against the people, knowing the knowledge of the condition, the spiritual condition of these folks, do you really think that they were seeking the Lord? The answer is no. They, all they were interested in was, where is the God of judgment? God, get us out of this problem right now, fix it, and go, go get that guy over there. Get justice. That's all they were concerned with. I stopped on this and actually in my Bible highlighted in orange, the Lord whom you seek. Because I often think that there are many people who come into the church, they say they're seeking, but I'm really not sure that they're seeking the Lord. I'm sure there are many people that come in and they need direction and they're seeking guidance and they have a hunger and a thirst. And the Beatitudes say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for they shall be filled. I'm sure that God knows his children. The question is many that come seeking and they say, I seek the Lord and I want the Lord's will. And I ask you something I've asked many times. If you really knew the Lord's will in your life, would you still remain? If you knew that maybe like the Apostle Paul, your destiny is to suffer, to be persecuted, to be tried, to be thrown in prison, and to be executed, would you stay? Christianity today has taken on such a terrible spin that most people can't even connect with the Apostle Paul's suffering. We have a little paper cut and we say, oh, I'm <laughs> suffering. The Lord whom you seek. And I'd say to you today, some of you who are seeking, some of you out there listening can only hear my voice on radio who are seeking, take the time to really get into the Word and make sure you're not coming into the church asking God to bless your carnality and to bless your way. Because when you come, there's only one way, and it's His way. It's not your way. It's not my way. It's His way. He's the boss. He calls the shots. Whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple. You see that temple belongs to him, even the messenger of the covenant. And I love this too, because you can read right over this and not connect the messenger of the covenant very profoundly in Hebrews 9 and 10 when it speaks of Jesus and Jesus' blood as the blood of the new covenant. No more the blood of goats and bulls to be shed, but this precious blood, the messenger of the covenant. God gave a covenant at the beginning, and that covenant is woven through and through. And I speak not of the law and the Ten Commandments. I speak of the design when he said, let us make man Adam in our image, beginning right there, right at the beginning, streaming right through the Bible. There was a covenant struck. Yes, we know about the the law, and I speak not of that because Jesus said, don't think I've come to destroy, but I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. I speak to you of the covenant of blood that is that beautiful scarlet thread that goes through this whole book. So when we speak of the messenger of the covenant and Jesus partaking in that last supper, when he says this blood, my blood, the blood of the new covenant, you see God was speaking a word of himself 
400 years before the time. And I, I, I read this passage and I thought, you know, I wonder how this might have come across in the day it was uttered. How was it received? Did people stand and say, oh boy, did you hear that? It's going to send a messenger, messenger of the covenant. Did it even make sense because they had no new covenant, only a relationship to the old covenant, to the law? But who may abide in the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap. And I'd ask you, especially those of you who've come out of the background of legalistic teaching, where people say, now you've got to do this, and you've got to perform, and you've got to jump through the hoops. If that is what you live by, friends, that is what you'll be judged by. And for those who understand the message of grace versus the message of the law, we stand in Christ's finished work, recipients of everything that he's done. We, we did nothing to deserve it. That message of grace, which cannot be heralded enough, the church is always, the tendency is always to go, just step back just a little bit more to Sinai, because here we've got a checkbox. And I'd say to you, if, if that is what you live by, that is what you will die by. And clearly through the New Testament, those words only have the capacity to bring you to death. They cannot give you life. So looking at this, I would ask the question, if I was standing amidst those people, who could stand his coming? Who could stand his appearing? You know, when people are pointing over to some brother over there or some sister doing something, and that's why I said, caution and put up the red flags, folks. While we're busy pointing the finger, the moat inspectors that make the rounds on a regular basis I'd say, without God's covering of Christ, without that shed blood covering us, who could stand? And the answer is nobody. And I see many saints step outside of that covenant and that covering of grace the minute they start back to the law. They have fallen from grace. Galatians and Ephesians covers this point sufficiently. So. I'd like to kind of highlight a few things that are said here because for the ones who understand this, two groups of people are being spoken of. Those who, at his appearing, and we know that he came once and will return. I don't think I have to convince you that Jesus said he would return. Do I have to convince any of you? <laughs> so, if you understand Two things will be perfectly clear when we study the rest of this book. Uh, the mention, for example, of John the Baptist as the forerunner to Christ, which in Jesus' day, they asked him about Elijah, and he said, Elijah's already come. They couldn't understand the prophecy, by the way, through Malachi, which spoke of sending a forerunner, and then you have in the last chapter and verse 5 when it says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. They couldn't understand that because they couldn't see the prophecy as we see it now. As often as has been described here, prophecy many times in the Word looks like a mountain range. From a distance, it all looks like one unit. You see all the ups and downs of the mountain, but as you get a little bit closer, you recognize there may be great gaps between one range and another, great gulf and chasm between prophecies. And this is exactly what's being said here. When they asked Jesus about Elijah, he said, Elijah's already come. And the great thing, we know that Malachi's prophecy was foretelling of the great and terrible day, that day when the two witnesses in the book of Revelation 11 will stand. And how ironic that they couldn't even read their own words and see the last words of Malachi are talking about, remember my servant Moses? And I'll send... Elijah. They didn't have the message we have, but it's perfectly clear to me Malachi was speaking of a future time yet to come. So when we look at these uh, messages, two things become clear to me. God will judge. He will bring justice. We know to those people who are in Christ Jesus, there is no ultimate condemnation. We know that. And I've said to you, I preach grace. I'm, I'm not here today to uh, make you 
uh, say, oh boy, I better go back and try and wash all my sins away because nothing can do that except the blood of Jesus. But I ask you today to just kind of pay attention to what's being said here because for the, for the ones trusting him, for the ones awaiting him, for the ones seeking him, for the ones who are delighting in his appearing, he is the following. It says, he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. Silver is always the color of redemption. He shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. Now, this is kind of interesting. I, I followed this mindset through the purpose of all this. Three things you'll encounter. They're here, but three things you'll encounter through the word. The mention of blood, the mention of water, and the mention of fire, always used for the cleansing and the purging and the purifying of the saints. And the mention here, we don't have any mention of blood because the messenger of the covenant, Jesus Christ, will shed his blood. They couldn't have understood that at this moment. But then a word here for us. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier. And through all of this, I want you to see God's care for you. If I could put a first heading on this, I'd say God cares for you. We talk much about the love of Christ and we talk about how people are cared for. But see how... Through the prophet's mouth, he compares us, his people, to silver and gold. And although those are corruptible, they are the most precious metals. Think about that for a minute. Later on, he's going to say, in the day when I make up my jewels. So we know that the imagery being used to those, only God sees the heart, but to those that trust him, he calls silver and gold redeemable, and for eternity. What then may I say except that it says he shall sit, and I want you to see his care. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier. And the means and method of refining and purifying in this particular place mentioned right here, where he says like a, ref a refiner's fire, is done by fire. You know, we talk about Christianity as being a journey and a pilgrimage. And we sometimes forget that the saints will go through things. I think one of the most popular messages through this church has been, blessed men go through valleys of weeping. There's another passage out of Psalm 66 where David says, through water and through fire. God brought us through water and through fire to a safe or wealthy place, to a place of safety. The saints are always going through. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't say though I die in the, in the valley of the shadow of death. I go through it. The saints are constantly being put through the fire, through testing. That's why I said to you, that book, First Peter, has spoken to me in times of trouble, in times of tribulation, where Peter says that the trying of your faith being much more precious than silver or gold that perisheth. Much more precious. So you've got to see the attention of the refiner sitting, and it says he, is, he shall sit. I think some of us have the tendency to think when the fire and the flame and the furnace is turned up and here comes the affliction and here comes the turmoil, if we even see God as the refiner, we think God has gotten up from his chair for a little while and I don't know, he went over here to converse with somebody else. He might not be interested in the fact that, hey, it's hot in here. <laughs> Can't take the pain and the pressure and the heat. There's a reason why God turns up the furnace. Many times we read through the Bible and we never make the applications to these things. Those three Hebrew boys in the furnace. I always have to be careful when I say their names. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We used to have a preacher friend of ours, he used to call the last guy, and to bed we go. <laughs> so I have to be careful I don't say it too fast. Those three Hebrew children, placed, bound into the fire, fully clothed, bound, and it says that the furnace was seven times hotter 
And the picture that we, we, we seldom walk away with is they weren't consumed. And in fact, it says that the hairs of their head weren't consumed. It says that their, what they were bound with was loosed and that there was a fourth man with them in the furnace, that being the Lord standing with them, the, a Christophany standing with them through that great affliction. We seldom make the application that the trial of our faith, that the fire and the affliction that comes upon us, just like those children, not a hair on your head will be lost. Through the fire of affliction, chains uh, that keep us bound are removed, and the Lord stands with us. We read about Paul and his trials and the things he faced, and the one line that stands out in his chronicles, he said, no one was with him through these uncertain times except the Lord stood with him. I want you to catch the picture. The refiner is not taking uh, scrap metals today. You might say, well, is that an, elite, an elitist comment? No. Uh, some of us don't look like gold or silver yet, you, you know, but it's in there. You know, if you're a person that goes looking for gold, you know that gold seldom, if ever, appears right on the surface and says, gold. <laughs> they have to mine for it. God knows the gold and the silver within each vessel. And I keep coming back to this, seeing the refiner sitting at his post, if you will, with the fire. And one of the giants, I didn't bring the book, and I wish I could remember his name, but I'm telling you, I'm quoting from somebody else. I wish I had come up with it, but he said, how does the saint of God know? How, how does the person know? Is, has God left the building? Has he turned up the heat? Is it so hot that we can't bear it? So the refiner is asked, how do you know, refiner, when the work is done? And the refiner sitting over the pot says, when I can see my image in the gold, in the silver, when I can see my reflection, when I look in it. And that's exactly when we're going through those trials, you have got to keep in your mind, there is no other way that you will make it into the kingdom of heaven. I'm sorry, not by good works. Our works may be part of an outraying of God's grace in you, but not by your efforts, but by the buffeting and by the chiseling away and by the furnace of affliction. And many times the furnace of affliction is turned up and we say, oh, I can't, I can't take it because you cannot see and I cannot see that while the furnace is turned up, the refiner is sitting there. He sees it all. He knows, just like the scripture says, he knows how much we can bear. The concept, I've said it before in my coinage of words, to de-drossify us, to take out the dross. How else, tell me, when people talk about purity and holiness? I feel bad for some of those folks. They put on the exterior garb of purity and holiness in their dress or in their behavior, but it's the inner man that's filthy. It's the heart or the inner woman, and it's the heart that is deceitful and filthy that needs to be cleansed, which is why I go back to the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. I told you from the Greek. The pure in heart is not what we think, but the catheterized. You know what a catheter is? Put into your body to be able to drain out the fluids. God is catheterizing our hearts daily if we're trusting him. And sometimes in that moment of affliction, we can't see it. The refiners care for you. Now, you may think what you want. I love these people that... They say they want the Lord's will, the Lord's will. They, they, they say, thy will be done. Okay, kid, come on, pot's over here, hop in. <laughs> no, 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 not that one, though. <laughs> oh, Lord, Father, thy will be done. And here comes the testing. I've never seen a saint... Any person calling themselves a saint, which doesn't mean you're perfect, just means set apart to God, that has crossed the finish line, because I've seen a lot be promoted, without going through some real serious trials. And I really don't think that, although it's God's business, he can do what he wants, but I don't think that there is some special massage chair that you can get in and make it into heaven without God seeing his reflection in you, and the only way that is done is putting you into the fire. You get thrown in there, 
And you remember while you're in there, like the children, like those three children in the flames, in the furnace, seven times hotter, like Paul by himself, the Lord stood with them. The Lord was there. What else does it say in this passage? It says, he's like a refiner's fire, like a fuller's soap. No, I'd like to see a picture of Job when he declared in Job 23, and I think it's verse 10, when he makes the declaration, though he's being put through the furnace of affliction, he's not out of it yet. He says, I know when this is all over, I'm going to come out as gold. But he was still in the moment, in the place, in the furnace of affliction when he said that. And how many times when stuff comes, Somebody asked me the other day, and I speak of affliction, trials, tribulations, fears, anything that can sway you to try and jump out of the heat for a minute. I had somebody ask me, have you, have you ever been to the place where you've had so much trouble put on you that you just didn't think you'd come through? Well, and I had to stop for a minute and be honest. And probably I would say in in my very early walk, I didn't have the certainty I have today that I have now. And there's not too many things I'm sure of except for this, that for the saint, for those who have committed their life to Christ, who are trusting in his finished work and abiding in him, he will not forsake you. He will not leave you. He knows exactly where you are. And when the moment comes where the furnace is being turned up, you can guarantee one thing. There is nothing that comes into the life of a saint that he does not let for his purpose. Now, how many have said, I don't want to see your hands. How many have said, well, it's not fair. You ever said that? No, don't. Sorry, I asked. Because that's the other thing we tend to do. We tend to act like children and say, it's not fair this is happening. Well, who said that it had to be fair? How about, thank you, Lord, Obviously, I've said this to you before, you must love me because not only have you turned up the furnace and it's really hot, I, I'm really starting to feel it now. You know, people want to talk about feeling the burn when they exercise. <laughs> Put a spiritual application on it. Feel the burn. He cares. He knows exactly where you are. He is, it doesn't say that uh, he sit, it doesn't say he walks away. He sits as a refiner. And the fire, by the way, the refiner's fire is not a forest fire. It's not a fire that's set and then left alone that burns to destroy. The intent here for the refiner's fire, fire specifically is to remove, to purify, and to cleanse and not to destroy. And once you get that in your brain, that God is not destroying you and he's not letting you be melted down. He's removing all the garbage that you cannot remove yourself. And anyone who tells you that you can, they probably are in the air conditioning right now, not in the furnace. And like the fuller soap, that's another interesting one. If you've seen the pictorial image of the, the, the old washboards and the soap that was used was not uh, the light, mild, gentle kind. It was that very harsh uh, salt-based, that, that's an interesting sidebar, uh, very strong, able to remove the toughest stains. Yes, even before Tide and Borax, can you imagine that? And so we're, we have two comparisons here, the fire and the fuller soap. Okay, tell the truth. When you were a kid, how many of you got the bar of soap in your mouth? Oh, that's just a few of you. Did it taste good? <laughs> Did it make you stop doing whatever it is that you... No, see, I love this guy right here. Is going, <laughs> of course not. All you remember is the taste. That's all you remember. I got the bar of soap, and I remember thinking, what good is that going to do anyway? <laughs> you walk around for days putting a, a dry washcloth in your mouth trying to get the soap taste out. And you'd think that that moment would be... Uh, a recognition of the fact that mom or dad was trying to say potty mouth or dirty mouth, but instead you just, re you just remember the, the taste of the soap and the mouth keeps going. <laughs> In fact, it learns new words that 
for an uttered before. But find it interesting right here, to those whom he loves, who are delighting in his appearing, who are delighting in seeking him, purifying, cleansing, like the fuller soap. And I, I, I love this because it has become such a reality to me as I stay in the scriptures. I feel sorry for those Christians, and they call themselves Christians, and yes, I'm doing one of these. I'm pointing radio people. I feel sorry for those people who have never been the recipient of God's grace, so the best they can do is say, go wash now. Go wash yourself. Go get clean and then come back and talk. God finds you and takes you right where you are. And it's only his cleansing power. This is the thing that if, oh boy. I, I, I wonder how many of those that I've met in my lifetime really believe this. We've said it so many times, and yet every single week, can you imagine this? Every single week since I've been pastor, every single week I have met a Christian brother or sister who does not understand, and I'm speaking of elders and people who should be mature. Does the Bible not say that your sins are completely removed? They were placed on him. He stood in your place. Does the Bible not say that? The Bible also mentions somewhere else that your sins in the Old Testament were cast behind his back or placed in the sea of forgetfulness. I can't understand for the life of me because we sin daily. I need daily, I've told you this before, daily forgiveness, daily pardon, daily grace. I know God's grace. I don't need to tell people some fancy story to get your attention. You either have placed your entire being on the finished work of Christ, and you stand there knowing that the refiner's fire, the furnace of affliction is working, and the fuller's soap is cleansing, and the messenger of the covenant, his blood has washed and cleansed you, and you are standing as a new creature in Christ Jesus, or you're not. Nothing in between. You either cleansed, washed, and a babe, starting a journey. And believe me, even the child of God who is beginning the journey, it's not like you stop sinning. That's the other fallacy. I just grind my teeth and I think, no, the more you walk with God, I've said this before, the more you walk and the closer you get, you know you're pretty close to the kingdom of heaven. When as you go, you're no longer saying, I'm okay. The more you go, the more you see the spots and the flaws and the dark and the sin and the stains. And the more honest you become with yourself. This is, this is my condition. You say, what, you just said you're washed and cleansed. That's correct. Washed and cleansed by him as long as I stay in him. But that lifelong journey is that battle that Paul speaks of, the flesh and the spirit warring, and it is, it is, it is a great warfare inside the believer, and that's why you remain and abide and with the knowledge. He cares about you. He knows about you. The only audience you must be concerned with is him. When you and he are walking together, and other people come against you, or say things about you, or criticize you, you have one audience you must please. I said this last week. And all the other people, that's God's problem. He'll deal with them. Now let me talk about those other people because they're mentioned here. I love it. The other people, they're in verse 5. There's the ones that God's coming to refine and to purge and to cleanse. And then there's those he's coming basically to, uh, it says, to judgment. I'll come near to you to judgment. And I will be a swift witness. I love that. Not just a witness, a swift witness against the sorcerers. I know people say, well, but, but we don't engage in that. Against adulterers, or we don't engage in that. Against false swears, or we don't engage in that. That was a lie. Against those that oppress the, or defraud the hireling in his wages, the widow, the fatherless, that turn aside the stranger from his right. And fear not me, saith the Lord. And what God is speaking against are those people 
who would prefer to seek counsel outside of him. When we look at sorcery, the minute we think of that, we conjure up witchcraft. But it is to seek God's counsel. He's speaking against it. He says, I'll come to judge those and be a swift witness against those who seek counsel outside of, outside of me and apart from me. Those who think they possess powers infinitely greater than me. You've got to see every, every word in the Hebrew may be slightly ambiguous but carries a pictorial meaning with it. Adulterers, people say, oh, God hates adultery. Well, that's true, but he spoke first against his people committing spiritual adultery as they went after idols, Baal worship and Moloch and every other asterisk that you can think of except worshiping the living God. So don't just have a one-track mind. When God speaks, there are some very deep words cutting to the quick against those false swears. Well, not me. I don't do that. You know, the ones that are always busy saying, on the altar of God, I swear. Jesus said, let your yeas be yeas and your nays be nays. This, if, you, if you mean yes, say yes, and if you mean no, say no. And he says that in the context of no amount of swearing can make it turn white or black. It is what it is. Speak your mouth, stand by that which you've said, or your mind, and stand by that which you've said. And against those that defraud the hireling in his wages, the widow, the fatherless, that turn aside the stranger from his right, and, and I add the end, and fear not me. And probably in the church of Jesus Christ today, I feel because there, there are many who preach grace, there's also that great concern that people don't have a healthy fear of God. Now, I'm not trying to scare people and make you... Oh, but there should be at all times some awareness. While we get so paranoid, we drive on the freeway and we see a cop come behind us and the lights go on. Oh, he's coming after me, the paranoia. And it turns out he goes and swoops around, goes after somebody else and goes, whoo! But I was only doing three miles over the speed limit. Or five. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> and we get so worried about that, we don't stop to think, God's not some policeman coming down to put the lights on behind us. But as the refiner sitting, he's watching. Just like the clay, he's watching. You know, when Peter says, cast your cares upon him, for he cares about you, it matters to him. You can either say today in my affliction, the fire's controlled, I see and know the refiner sitting there watching me, or you can say like these people, where's the God of judgment? And trust me, there will come a day. The prophecy is laid out pretty plain. There will come a day. When Jesus returns, and yes, the two witnesses must stand. Revelation 11 declares it, which I believe to be Moses and Elijah. Certainly Elijah, and certainly a good uh, fact to stand on is that's how Malachi's prophecy ends, speaking of Moses and Elijah. I believe that he will return for his church. I believe that those who have trusted, who have faith, who have placed their entire being in Christ are covered by the blood. You don't need to sit here and go, oh God, I'm not sure, like some of those evangelists say, if you died today, where would you go? Why would you ask such a question? The real honest person would say, well, I, I'd like to go to heaven. Why bother even asking, except it's just a scare tactic to get people to, come on, get clean and come to the altar. Well, I believe that God's going to do his work, and the work he's given to us is to trust him. The last thing I'd like to say of this passage is those who figure out eventually in reading this that God is not to be mocked. Those that understand in your trial, in your affliction, in your greatest hour of need, He is there. He cares. He comforts. He takes care of His children. And as I've said, the only way to do it is to turn up the furnace and I bet you, maybe today, some of you sitting here saying, but I, I don't have any affliction today. I'm not in trial. And I say to you, cheer up, my brother and sister. Because it'll come. Just like that song, it'll come. And at least you can know when it hits. And it will.
because you're sitting here listening to me with an interest in his word, that your trials, the furnace of your trials, that the refiner is sitting there and watching you and saying, essentially, this is probably unpleasant, but this is the only way to get the dross out. The master's touch and the master's care and the master's comfort should just be an absolute joy to stand back and say, okay, it doesn't make the pain any better in that I have to go through it. But like all of those promises, I will go through. Last thing, and then I'm done. The last word I'd say on this is, if you keep reading in verse 6 of that same chapter 3, it says, For I am the Lord, and I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. That's the little note of grace right there that says, even for those not yet God-governed, God-controlled, God-wrestling, uh, and God-contending people, not yet to that place, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. The message today, if I could sum it up and say to you what I, I really had on my heart when I came here, is people everywhere I turn are going through something. You know, the expression, the... The rug was pulled up from under my feet. I didn't even see it coming. When does Satan announce, hey, I'm coming? <laughs> when does the refiner say, I'm going to turn up the heat a couple of notches? And it is in the preparedness of the saint in being equipped, the necessity, it is the necessity that each person stand in the knowledge God has a plan. And part of his plan is not what, maybe what some of you came in the church thinking. God will take away my debt. God will clean up my health. God will help me raise my children. They'll be perfect. God will uh, grant me a better car and a better house. And God may do all of that. He may do all of that. I can't tell you for each individual is different, but I can tell you one thing you can be guaranteed of. And don't fool yourself, and I don't want to fool myself either. If you are his child, you are going to go through the furnace of affliction. Don't think it strange. Let me quote the voice of one quite familiar as I've spent time in his writing. Think it not strange. First Peter, if you want to turn there, gives the warning. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. I want you to remember that next time the pressure comes. I want you to remember that next time when you, you feel you just can't, you can't continue. God, you just want to say it. God, where are you? I want you to remember this because it will happen. And when it does, I want you to look at this and know something. Peter did not know his future. So uncertain, he did not know his fate, even though Jesus said, another one's going to bind you and lead you unto death. I'm sure it did not quite register that that was the final moment for him. And in that moment, he said, don't crucify me like my Lord. I don't deserve that. Crucify me upside down. Um, the next part of this is remarkable, but rejoice. Rejoice. Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, this is Malachi right there as I've just described it to you, when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Well, it's not too happy right now. Well, you just keep hanging on to the wonderment of what I just said. You cannot see perhaps right now today the chasms and gulf of time between certain events in your life as God has spoken your name before the foundations of the earth, before you even brought into existence that he spoke your name. Now, I don't say that everything is wound up, but I do tell you God has a plan, and it may not look like yours, and the plan may include some very hot trials. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Read the last part of this with me. It says here, if ye be reproached, for the name of Christ, happy are you, literally blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. That's all I can tell you. You say, well, 
Shouldn't you give me some more comfort? I should have a better promise than this. I just gave it to you out of Malachi. That at his appearing, the ones who have waited, whom have sought, whom have desired, are not going to say, oh, you mean he's here? And by the way, the scripture says he'll come suddenly. You know, we live in a strange universe. We Californians, we know we live in earthquake land. We know it. And then all the talking heads say, get ready for the big one. You know, and every now and then they'll come out and they'll have their backpacks and say, earthquake readiness prevention. You know, they've got their contraptions and everybody has their goods and they, they get everybody riled up. Oh, this could, be, this could be the time. The big one's coming. Get ready. Get prepared. Well, for, for we who live in California, it's pretty evident that eventually we will have an earthquake or two and possibly a really big one. Not like we, didn't, we weren't warned. And for those of us who live here who know we are responsible individuals, we prepare, at least to some degree. Now, we don't walk around every day thinking, oh, the earth might shake today. But we're ready. Now, you cannot jump to this application with the Lord Jesus because I don't think an honest person would say, I'm ready. In fact, I look for his coming, I wait, come get me, and probably when the Lord appears, we'll all go. <sighs> but it's a good time today to just read what I've said and understand God cares for you. Don't let your trials dissuade you or convince you otherwise than God cares for you. And probably if you're not being put through some fiery trials, I'd say get on your knees and start praying because it's the child of God that will be placed in those circumstances. So if you've been suffering, if you have suffered, or if you're going to suffer, know you're one of his. He loves you. He cares for you. He's sitting and watching to comfort you, given his word and his promise. Rejoice. You may not feel like it right now, but when the heat is turned off, at least for a season, you're going to say, and what was I scared of? And what did I fear? God's not the author of fear. I, I made it through. And you know why I made it through? And you know why you made it through? He was in control. He was sitting right there. No, I could not see him, but the word says he was right by my side. And so it is with you. Take the courage Take the promise and know that God has not left you. He still cares for you. He loves his precious saints. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www dot pastor melissa scott dot com